Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be. Groovy guys, groovy gals, Autodesk folk all over, wherever you're attending from. My name is Zach Travis. I am with Autodesk Technical Support, and we are presenting another Build Your AutoCAD IQ webinar here, brought to you by Product Support. And with me today is Mike Hurtado. He'll be presenting half of the presentation, and I'll uh, do the back end. Um, Along with us for Q&A purposes is Naman. He's uh, one of our expert elites and knows uh, quite a bit about the program, so he's a good guy to have along for the ride. This is us here again. Uh, nothing new. If you've attended any of these Back to Basics webinars with us before, usual cast of characters. And those are our details, and the slide deck will be up along with the video if you can't get enough. All right, uh, before we get started, as usual, the uh, questions are in the interface for the webinar. So as we go along, feel free to ask anything you want. Uh, Naman will try to field them. I'll try to field them when I'm not presenting, and Mike will do the same when he's not presenting. Uh, as we finish up here, you'll, you'll get a survey and uh, uh, all that good stuff. So if you have any kind of feedback, good, bad, indifferent, whatever, we need it, we use it, and we certainly appreciate any feedback we can get from you on these things. So coming up uh, in our webinar series, just want to highlight the next four weeks of presentations in the webinars. We've got uh, working with styles in AutoCAD 2017, and that's next week with uh, Voker. I believe that there's going to be some overlap between what we cover today and what Voker's going to cover during that one. But uh, while we may not get in too deep on it, he's going to get very deep on it and vice versa. So there are some things we might cover that he doesn't cover, so not a bad idea to check them both out. Uh, then on the 11th, we've got the third dimension doing some really cool stuff. They're covering 3D printing with AutoCAD and Autodesk Print Studio. I think they're talking about uh, putting together uh, some 3D modeling and then for actually printing it out, so they may have some photos and video to show with that. I'm not sure what they have in store, but it's certain to be cool. Um, coming up on August 18th, the tips and tricks, that one's to be determined. It's a mystery at this point. Still brewing up something. I'm sure it'll be very cool, so uh, we'll update the schedule as we go. So by next week, I imagine Voker will probably have that to show you in the schedule for coming up. And then finally, at the end of the month, August 25th, about a month from now, is uh, myself and Mike, again, who will be uh, doing some basic plotting uh, topics in AutoCAD and AutoCAD LT. Uh, again, the Back to Basics series that we cover here is mostly going to be focused on the AutoCAD LT product because everything that exists in LT also exists in full AutoCAD. So we didn't want to go the other route and be exclusionary and leave some things out. So again, the regular links here, all this, all these things you see here, um, the community forums are always out there. It's a great source and a sometimes underutilized resource. People don't realize just how knowledgeable the community is in the forums. People have been using the product since way before I've been working here, and Mike and everybody else probably put together. There's some people out there because AutoCAD is a very mature product, as you all well know, and it's another way of saying it's really old. But uh, it just means that there's been a lot of changes throughout the years and a lot of good folks out there in the, in the forums uh, running their own blogs, uh, working for the resellers and our other partners. So get out there, check that stuff out. There's a lot of good information to be had out there. Let's try that. There we go. So this week, the topic is annotation. Uh, we're going to cover text styles, text objects, mText objects, dimension objects, and finally leaders and M leaders. And that's the majority of your annotations. Now, um, what are annotation objects? I mean, the, what does it mean inherently? It just means that it's information added to the drawing geometry. So without it, 
we just have a bunch of lines and circles and arcs and polylines and whatnot. We wouldn't know necessarily, sure, we could recognize the shape of a house or whatever uh, we happen to be drawing, but without adding text and dimensions and liters and M liters and notes here and there, uh, we'd be lacking some, some additional information that, that can be thrown in and uh, it's invaluable. So it's, it's important to know how to use these tools. And again, uh, as I always say, uh, these webinars should be not viewed as any kind of a substitute for proper training that you can get from our, our partners, our resellers that double as training centers, um, some really, really great instructors out there and some really good material. Uh, these webinars are more just a presentation and overview of the tools within the products and some, maybe cover some things that you didn't know. Uh, maybe you've taken training already and maybe they missed some of the things we cover and certainly vice versa because we don't get into every little nook and cranny of the program but we try to cover things that we think will be helpful to you and working these commands and functionalities into your daily workflows because that's what it's all about, getting things done. So let's take a look at AutoCAD and see how this all works at this point. I'm going to hand things over to Mike, and he'll take it for a while. Awesome. Thanks, thanks Doc. All right, let me present my monitor here. All righty. Um, so as Zach man mentioned, annotation objects, uh, they include dimensions, notes, and any other type of explanatory symbols or objects that are commonly used to add information to your drawings. Um, so what we're going to be doing is demonstrating some of the most commonly used annotation tools. Um, fortunately, we won't have time to go over all of them because, frankly, we could probably do an entire webinar on, on annotation scales if we really wanted to go wild. Uh, so without any further ado, let's get right to it. Um, so here we have AutoCAD LT open. Um, I have a you know, just drawing open in the background. Um, you're going to see a tab up here for annotate. And this kind of gives you your you know, annotation tools. Um, first up, it's going to be text. Um, so text is one of the most important components when it comes to annotating. Uh, text style is really where you can customize the look and feel of your text, and it's actually going to make its way into some of the other annotation objects. Um, so it's kind of where it all starts. Going in here, um, this first box up here is where you can actually manage your text styles from. Drawing already includes some of them. I'm going to open up the text style window just so you can get a, a feel of what this looks like if you wanted to create your own text style. Um, one thing to note, like I mentioned, this, this drawing already has some textiles in there. Um, if you're working at a big company or firm, um, a lot of times you'll be working off templates, so your template would probably already include a lot of these textiles in there. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to kind of go in there and make your own, um, I'll be showing you just how to do that. Um, so right up here on the left, you'll see a list of all the textiles that you have. Um, if you wanted to see the styles that are currently being used in the drawing, you have that option down here. Um, let's go ahead and create a new one. So once you've you know, created the new text style, you have quite a few options to play around with. Uh, first and foremost, you have the font. If I were to drop down here, you'll see that you have a big list of fonts that you can go through. Um, you'll notice that the symbol on all of them aren't the same, so you have this TT symbol and then you also have a compass symbol. Um, that's because there's two main fonts that AutoCAD uses. You'll have your, your true type font, which is a, kind of your Windows operating system font installed directly on your operating system. Um, let me just go to one of the most commonly used ones, the Times New Roman, your Comic Sans, that's, that's going to be your, your true type font. You'll also notice that there's this .shx extension for the fonts that have the little compass on there. So the .shx font is used by AutoCAD. Um, you know, it's not installed on your Windows operating system, but you, know, you could go online um, and find these different shx fonts, install them into AutoCAD, and then use them in your drawings. 
um, you might be wondering where you could actually get, you know, where these SHX files are living. Let me close out of here for a minute. I'm going to save the changes so I don't have to create that webinar one again. I'm going to go to the options right here. So it should be listed under support file search path right over here. So this is kind of where AutoCAD goes to look for your fonts by default. Just to show you that I'm not lying, let's go and look for them. So it's program files, Autodesk. So this one is looking for LT2017. Let me find that font folder. There you go. So all those SHX file, uh, you know, font files that we were looking at, this is where they live. So if you wanted to add additional fonts, download them off the web, grab them from you know, wherever you end up getting these fonts and drop them off into this area over here and it'll be able to you know, populate within AutoCAD and you'll be able to use those fonts. Um, so yep, that's where they live. Um, what you can also do is add a new support file search path if you don't have your fonts in here. So if you have like a network drive location that'll have your fonts, you could tell AutoCAD to go look for the fonts in there. But this is just kind of the default when you install you know, your AutoCAD software. All right, let's go back to the textile window. Going to go back to this webinar font that we've been working with. Um, you're going to notice down here the use big font option. This use big font option is only available when you're using the SHX um, font type. So let me just to demonstrate when you do the true type, that option doesn't become available to you. Basically what it is, it's an additional font type that lets you add special symbols in there. So this becomes really useful if you're, you know, trying to produce plans in like Japanese or Mandarin that use special characters outside of the regular alphabet that we're you know, accustomed to. Um, I personally don't use that too much, but that option is available to you if you would like it to be. If you were to use your standard two type, you can you know, fidget around with the font style. You could make it bold, italic, regular. Uh, for this one, I'm just going to use the Times New Roman just to kind of make it a little bit easier to see. Um, next up, you can play around with the size. Um, I'm not going to check off this annotative because Zach is going to be touching up on that a little bit later. Um, but here you can actually set the height of your text. Um, what I would suggest doing, however, is leaving this at zero because later on, if you were to set your height over here, like I mentioned, you know, your text style ends up being used in your other annotation objects. So if you set this to something other than zero, you'll be locking yourself into that text height. So if I were to put this at two and I go into my dimension styles and try to create a new dimension style, I won't be able to move that from two. So suggest leaving it at zero. Just make your life a little bit easier. You're not banging your head against the keyboard later trying to figure out why you can't change the height. I'll uh, try to point this out a little bit later when we're going over dimensions, but just keep that one in mind. So down here you have some additional effects that you can play with. Um, you kind of see over here on the left, you can make your text upside down, you can make it backwards if you really don't want anybody to read it. Um, you can change the width factor, you can make your text really wide if you wanted to. That's really wide, there you go. You can change the oblique angle. So yeah, there's quite a few things you can play around with in here. Right, for now, I'm just going to leave it Times New Roman regular. Keep everything pretty standard. Apply this guy. So that is the you know, textile that we're using right now. So with your textiles all set, um, some of the basic things that you could do is just make some text or M text. I'm going to start off with just a regular text line. That's going to be huge. it ended up being ridiculously big. The reason being that up here, this is where the text height shows up. So let me do that once more. 
see how that is eight, eight, you know, 881, that's why it was so big. So, I'm gonna switch this guy over, oh, I can't switch it, it's out of here, switch that guy there. Try that once more, and then it shouldn't be as big. No, it doesn't want to behave now. But if your text ends up being too, too big, what you can just do is select it, go to properties, and switch the height. So it's a little, being a little bit finicky right now, but at the end, got it to be the size that we wanted to. Additionally, you can make M text. So multi-line text. Actually, let's do build your AutoCAD IQ. Ended up being big again. But with your M text, you could actually make multi-line text. Move this guy over here. So over here, I have just a single line of text. I have my multi-line text down here. Um, you have some additional options with, when playing around with your text. You could do a spell check. You can you know, align your text. So if I wanted to align these two guys, I can. And then down here is really just scale, which again, Zach will be showing you when we get to the annotation scaling portion of this webinar. So cool, we have our our textile all set. I'm gonna move on over to dimensions. So for dimensions, you know your model requires dimensional information to define the size and position of the design. You could add dimensional information to specify the length, diameter, rotation angle of geometric elements in the model. Uh, as you could probably imagine, this is pretty important to helping others understand your design. So kind of similar to the um, text style um, window, you'll have the option over here to manage your dimension styles. Um, similar to before, you'll have a list of all the styles that are currently in your drawing. And then you can you know, go through it, select all styles or styles in use. Um, for this one, I'm just going to use all styles because I want to see all the styles that are in here. Um, you can go ahead and create a new one like I had mentioned earlier. Um, a lot of times this is already set up in the template for you, but if you wanted to go in and create your own, just select new. I'm going to create new one. Uh, you could add, you know, give it kind of a template so you're not starting completely from scratch. You could also specify what kind of dimensions you want to use it for. I'm just going to use all dimensions. And then I get this dimension style window. So in here, you'll have a bunch of different options for you know, changing the look and the feel um, of your dimensions. Uh, so these dimension styles really help you establish your standards. Um, it's kind of important so you have a you know, consistent look and feel so you're not changing up what your dimensions look at every single turn. Um, also, if you're submitting plans to the state, they typically end up having some sort of you know, standard uh, dimension style that you should adhere to. Uh, you can really play around with just about anything in this dimension style. Um, it's pretty cool because you can actually see it, see some of the changes live over here on the right. So if I wanted to change the color, more than able, you know, more than happy to be able to do that. You could really go wild and make your dimensions look however you want them to. Uh, you could even you know, delete some of the extension lines. You could also delete some of the dimension lines. 
to make them really confusing if you want to go for that look. You can play around with the symbols and the arrows. You can change the size of your arrows. You know, there's just a ton of customization that you can do in here. Um, and it all really comes down to what, you know, what are the standards? What do you need to have your dimensions look like? Um, and if you're doing this for fun, you could just make them whatever you want them to look like. So going over here to text, this is what I was mentioning before. So the reason that those textiles are so important is because you end up using them later on. So this is the webinar one that we created earlier. You're going to notice that the numbers did change to reflect that now our font is Times New Roman. Um, go ahead and change the color if you would like. So this text height over here was what I was mentioning before. Since we set it to zero, we could go in and change it to whatever we want now. Uh, we have that option available to us. But if we would have put this at another value in the textile, it would be grayed out similar to how you see this fraction height scale grayed out. That's what would have happened here. So that's why I would recommend leaving that text height at zero when creating your textile so you have the freedom to you know, change that later on in the rest of your annotation objects. So moving right along, there's a bunch of other options to change how your dimensions look. You could change the alignment. Um, this also lets you play around with the fitment. Um, so, you know, in the situation, situation where you're dealing with very little um, dimensions and your numbers just aren't going to fit, you could figure out, you know, tell it, hey, I want you to do this when you run into that situation. Um, or I want you to place it besides the dimension when that happens. You really do get a lot of customization in here. You also have the option of choosing your units. So you can go to architectural if you wanted to switch. My background is in engineering, so this is what I'm most comfortable with. So you could also have alternate units. So if you want engineering units and architectural units, you could have them displayed directly underneath. You could also play around with where they're going to show up. And then you also have tolerances. So I don't use them at too much, but you have the option to you know, add deviations, add limits, and you know, play around with that. So as you can probably tell, there's a bunch of different things that you can play around with in here and just edit your dimension styles to your heart's content. So let's go with this basic one. You're going to see that it populated up here. You can select the layer that you want the dimensions to come in with. I'm just going to leave it as use current. Um, when it comes to actually placing your dimensions, you have quite a few you know, options available to you. You can make them linearly, aligned, angular. Um, it kind of depends on the situation because not all of your dimensions are going to run into the same situation. You know, it's not going to always going to be that same situation. Sometimes, you, sometimes you're going to want to know the diameter of the radii of circular objects. You're going to want to know the arc lengths. Um, you're going to sometimes want to you know, give different dimensions for lines um, or distances. So you, you can play around with all this stuff in here. Um, you also have the, the jog option. So it kind of just, you can see it down there, it just creates a little jog for your dimension. You also have the ordinate option down here. Um, the ordinate option, it'll if if you look at the picture in there, basically what ends up happening is if you're showing dimensions, you know, I want a circle maybe one foot from my start point, and then if you end up having a mistake at each interval, you'll end up with something you know super super off at the end of your design. So um, you can kind of measure the distance from the origin um, as it's kind of shown and explained in there. Um, but yeah, there's a bunch of different ways that you can place dimensions in here. 
sake of demonstration, I'm going to create one here. So there's one dimension. So that's kind of like the you know typical way of putting a dimension in, but there's also other options in there. If you wanted to say, hey, I'm feeling a little lazy today, want to just have AutoCAD do it for me, you could select that quick dimension and have it you know, kind of do it for you. Um, since we never really told AutoCAD what to do with these weirdly placed dimension, you know, the fitment issues over here, it kind of just smushes it in there. Um, but if we wanted to play around with that look, we could go in to the dimension style and edit that. You also have your baseline or the continuous option over here. So baseline kind of goes back to that ordinate, um, you know, ordinate option. You have your base point and then you could measure the lengths of different points to that original origin point. You could also do continue, um, which is kind of what it did over here. It'll just continue making your dimensions. Uh, let me do this. Let's say I want to continue this guy. There. So instead of having to go in and individually do it one by one by one, you could you know, use that that tool. Hey, Mike, um, you we have, have a request to do the quick dim one more time because it's sure. really really a nifty thing, and uh, yeah, it happens so fast when you do it. It's it, it it is an aptly named command. Yeah, it it is a very aptly named command because it's because it is very quick. Um, so, yep, you just use the quick dim. So. You can click up here or you could use the QDIM. And then you just select the gym on a dimension, really. So once I selected it, I just pressed spacebar or enter. And it gives me the option to create my dimensions. So I could do that. Let me press spacebar to repeat the command, select all these guys once more, and there you go. I don't have to go in there and do them individually one by one. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, I hope that that's helpful, but it really is just a very, very quick way to do your dimensioning um, and just have AutoCAD do it for you. Um, up here, you'll have some additional formatting things that you can play around with. Um, you could add, you know, little jog lines. You could adjust the spacing. You could make breaks. So if you were doing, you know, a command or a dimension and it is, you know, overlapping over something in your drawing, you could create a break and make it so that it has a little space and it doesn't look, you know, like it's overlapping. Uh, one of the really cool things that I like doing, and it actually saves somebody or saved me a lot of time. Um, there's an update command over here. So if you say, let's, add a, let's say I don't want to use this webinar one anymore, I'm kind of changing my mind, that's not what I want it to look like, or whoops, I screwed up the, the, the style, I need to adhere to the correct standards, let me switch it over. You know, switch over to another dimension style. If you do update, you know, switch, make, make the dimension style, the one that you want, the current one, click update over here. You can select dimensions that have been created and update them to whatever the current dimension style is. So that's a pretty nifty command if you ended up you know, screwing up the, the dimension style and you don't want to go in and do them one by one. I'll demonstrate that again. So I'm going to switch them back to my webinar ones. Click all these guys. And there you go. I switched it back. But I personally like some more color. So I'm going to go and update them again. So that's a you know really nifty tool that you can use. Um, down here, you end up with some more formatting options. 
Uh, so back to those tolerances, you could add them in. You also get that oblique option. You could change the text angle, so if you don't want them to be linear like this, you could edit it to change the, you know, the angle of the dimension. You could change how they're justified. And then you could also override, so if you decide that you want to change some stuff in there, you could override your dimension style and make the edits that you want. So, you know, that's a very quick overview of dimensions and dimension styles. Um, so now I'm going to toss it back to Zach, who's going to go over leaders and some annotation scaling. Indeed. And yes, indeed, that's a, it is a quick overview, and, and Boker will be presenting styles next week and getting a little bit more in-depth with them, so you'll be, you want to be sure to check that out. That is the beyond the basics, so it's uh, meant to be a little bit more in-depth. So at this point, I'm going to, uh, going to cover... Uh, last bit of annotations, which are the that haven't been covered yet, which are uh, I mean, arguably you could count tables, I suppose, but we're, that's another webinar into itself, really. So we're going to wrap this up with the leaders, Q leaders, same thing. What are they? Have you heard of a Q leader uh, and M leaders? But uh, before I get too far ahead of myself again, I was reminded that I had neglected to do everybody's favorite part of the webinar. And that's to do a few polls. Hooray. All right. I can hear you rejoicing out there in your offices, wherever you happen to be. So uh, let's just do a couple of quick polls here, and then we'll go back into the content. Uh, we just want to get a feel for where you all are and your levels of experience and whatnot. So uh, is this your first Autodesk Help webinar? We like to see the returning folks, of course, but we hope that we'll have new folks every time as well. And uh, looks like we're just getting about to the end of this guy here. And it uh, looks like we're about 80% tallied. So let's, let's close that one up, and I'll share the results with you there. So it looks like the vast majority are return customers. Um, next, we want to know what you primarily use as your main AutoCAD tool out of the, the list here. And if it's other, you know, go ahead and mark other. If you don't use AutoCAD at all, if it's 3ds Max or whatever you happen to be, and you're just curious about AutoCAD and attending this, that's fine too. Absolutely, everybody's welcome here. So we want to tailor the content that we present in these back to basics for for the folks uh, out there and you know like I said before there's nothing in LT that isn't in any of the other AutoCAD and AutoCAD verticals like electrical and MEP and map and civil so all this information should be helpful in that and uh, all these commands and, and variables exist in those applications as well so let's close this out I'll give you a quick look at what that all came out at. And there's a switch. A lot of times we get a, uh, mostly LT, but it uh, looks like in this time it's uh, reversed on us for, uh, for AutoCAD. So that's good. Uh, let's do a couple of more. Now that we've seen text and dimensions, i um, like to get a feel for how you're using that part of the program out there. Uh, you may be in an office where everything's really tightened down and the standards are the standards and you just use the dimension styles that are in the templates as they're given to you. Or you might be a little more uh, free to do whatever you need to do and, and change the dimension styles. It may, it may depend on you know, the client. Uh, they may have certain requirements of how things are supposed to look in the, in the uh, plans you're drawing up for them. So that can certainly change and vary. So, all right, uh, I'm not going to let this one go nearly as long. I'll close this one out, take a quick look at that. 
looks like the majority are doing a mixture there of uh, styles that are standards and then also ones that you create yourselves, which is great. And then lastly, before we move into the back to the content, um, just a quick query about annotative scaling in your annotations, in your M text, in your leaders, your M leaders, your tables, your hatches, um, any and all. So we'll we'll get into annotation scaling here right at the very end. And again, we could probably do a whole hour on just annotation scaling and how it works and all the ins and outs. But we'll try to give you a, a good overview of it in here so you can uh, investigate more. And there are some links in the PowerPoint as well, uh, the slide deck we're going to put up, that are very good at explaining what it is. There's a link to a video from lynda.com that I think is one of the best videos that I've seen on annotation scaling. And it's from a couple of years ago, but really the, the feature hasn't changed much since then, so, so that's fine. So let's close this out. We'll share this. Uh, and there's a fairly decent amount of percentage of uh, folks out there that at this point aren't familiar with annotation scaling. So that's what we're here to do. We're hoping to introduce you to that and let you know that it can potentially save you some time and effort as you go through your work day there. All right, so uh, we've got one more poll at the very end we'll catch uh, after we wrap up. But at this point, uh, we'll get out of that and restore that. And we'll get back into the program here and we'll talk about leaders and M leaders. Now, a leader in general sense is a, it's a line or a spline that has some kind of an arrowhead indicator on one end, doesn't have to be an arrow, it could be a dot, could be a hash, could be a whatever. Uh, and then at the other end, you've either got multi-line text or, uh, or, a, or a block that uh, indicates what the leader is pointing to. And we'll go over what these look like here. So uh, both the, the end point, the text, the M text, the block, the arrowhead, that's all customizable. Uh, the point of a leader object is to, you know, just like any of these other annotation objects, is to annotate one or more objects where, you know, in cases where placing text directly next to the object would be not feasible. Maybe there's not enough room. Uh, maybe there are a bunch of things jammed together and putting text in there really close up just wouldn't work. That's where leaders are handy to come in, and we'll take a look and see what these look like. So um, quite a few years ago now, we, we introduced M leaders, which are multi-leaders, and they've, they've really become the de facto standard in the product, but uh, Q leaders and, uh, and regular leader objects are still there, and we'll cover both of them here, so we'll take a look. So let's, uh, let's begin by just drawing an M leader, and we can do that. Uh, let's go to the annotate ribbon tab, and uh, let's just make a multi-leader. So we specify the leader landing point. Uh, you can lock in these angles, but I usually leave it free so I can place it wherever I like. And then once you do that, then it's going to prompt you to put in some annotation text. So we could say, say, here is an M leader. And since it allows us to do multi-line text, we can take advantage of that. Um, and then we click to get out of it. And there is our M leader. Now, the cool thing about an M leader is that it's a, it's a multi-line text object in this case, along with this leader line and an arrowhead. They're all blocked together. They're not a block, really, but uh, they they have certainly hallmarks of a block and that you've got different types of objects all grouped together for a common purpose. Now you can extend the, the length of the landing line with this grip here in the middle and then this grip up here where the text is and this grip here where the uh, stretch point is. You can also move those around and I'll show you what that looks like. Say we wanted to move it over here. Everything comes with and did you see what happened there? As after we went past the center point, it flipped over to being docked to the left side. And you can control that through the through the M leader styles. What behavior happens when you move things around? Uh, you can also use the grip that's near the M text object as well to drag things around the same way. Now contrast this with a regular leader object. Uh, let's just do a quick leader. 
Uh, it gives you the same kinds of prompts. You specify a start point, let's say over here, next point, next point, and then it's, if you look at the command line, it's asking us if we want an annotation or if we want to specify yet another point. Let's do another point, and another point, and another point. And we could go on indefinitely adding points here because there's no restriction on, on how many, because leaders unlike M leaders, aren't governed really by a, a style. Uh, if anything, they get their, they take their cues from the current dimension style. So at this point, let's, let's just hit enter to put in an annotation and say, here is a leader. And this is the second line. So much like the uh, regular M leader, a leader is a little more basic. Uh, you can you can grab the grip closest to the text, move it around, and it tends not to. Uh, let's see. I think I might have. There we are. There it goes. So there's only, yeah, the only the grip here at the very end, the M text location, that's the only grip you can use to drag around and have the, the line follow along with you. If you, uh, if you instead grab the, the leader portion of it and grab the grip points there, it just, it just moves those around. Now, Q leaders is a, is an extension of the leader command. And what a Q leader does, a Q leader adds some other abilities uh, and primarily you can go into settings there if you just hit s there it'll take you into a q leader settings dialog um, it's got some cool things in here that you can do uh, the one that's really i'm going to point out here is this annotation reuse um, if you start with reuse next, what that means is that the next annotation you create, it's going to then, as the tooltip shows there, it's going to then use that for all subsequent leaders. So we'll see what that looks like. So let's make a leader here. And in this case, I left it for copy object. So it's going to prompt me. Now I've got this object, this block here that I made. I'm going to choose that. And as you can see, it placed it on the end of my leader. So now if I look in Q leader again and I go back to settings, now the dot is you switch to reuse content instead of reuse next because it's already gathered the next thing which was the W block that I uh, added there, the, the block that is a W, not a W block, can be confused there. So if we do a, a Q leader now and we start somewhere it's going to automatically place that same block at the end. And the same would be the case if I had used uh, text instead of choosing an object. Um, and that is a kind of nifty thing too with the queue leaders is that you can set it for object and each time you place one, uh, if you're not setting for reuse, if you leave it to none, you can say copy an object. So each time that you draw a leader object, it will prompt you to copy an object. Now, it's a little misleading. It can't just be any old object. Uh, as you can see here, it can be an M text, it could be a tolerance, it could be a block. It can't be a, a line or a circle or a hatch or any other type of object. So it's a little misleading. It just says copy an object. Uh, here I was going to give a demonstration of putting a hatch on the end of a leader, but you can't quite do that. So. So by and large, you know, in most most instances you're going to be using M leaders these days, um, but there are some instances where the Q leader thing gives you some options that you, you can't do necessarily with an M leader. One thing you can do with an M leader, though, that you can't do with the others is you can add lines, and I'll show you what that looks like here. If you right-click the M leader, we can add a leader, and it'll keep prompting you until you hit enter to stop it. So now we've got many leaders coming off this one annotation here. So if you had, say, you know, maybe you wanted to point out all the windows or all the screw heads or something, uh, you could put a leader, a multi-leader, to any and all of them. And by the same token, you can select the thing, right-click it, 
and you can remove leaders too. Uh, you don't have to. It's very, very customizable. Exact. Uh, yes, this sir. is Amon. Hey, um, Matthew is asking, can you redo this uh, funky multi-pointed leader that you just did? Sure, absolutely. This guy over here, I'm assuming, is the one we're talking about. Let's get rid of that. Yep. Okay. So I'll show you just real quickly here a contrast. A queue leader, if you go into the settings, has a setting here for leader line and format where it has a maximum number of points set. And when you reach that maximum number of points and includes the initial point, it's then going to prompt you for the annotation. Okay, so that's why if I did a queue leader here and I went click, 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 now it's prompting me for the annotation. Or it's, it's asking me for the copy of the object to put as the annotation. Uh, so, it's, so I've got one, two, three points because that's what's specified in queue leader. If I, by contrast, if I just do just leader, just the command leader, and I start my leader, I can click and click and click and click and click and click and click as many points as I want to. And then when I'm ready to put in the annotation, you see at the prompt there, it's asking me, do I want annotation? I'll just press enter. And then that will lead me to put in uh, the leader is here. Uh, Zach, they have a question actually. Can you access the leader settings once more? The Sure. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the regular leader command doesn't give you these options, but Q leader does. Now, when you're done making a Q leader, which is this guy over here that I made, you see in properties it tells us it's a leader. And if I select this one that I made using just the regular leader command, it's also a leader. But uh, using the Q leader gives you a few more controllable options. Um, it was a it was a step towards what eventually ended up where we have M leaders and you have all kinds of control. And uh, M leaders they have their own styles which you'll define here. And if you want to modify a, an M leader style, you've got things like, you know, how many leader points can I have? Similar to what we had in Q leader. That's where they that's where they got that maximum leader points. It looks just like that line. Uh, the content, you want it to be M text, you want it to be a block, or do you want no content at the end of your M leader? Uh, what's your is it going to be straight? Is it going to be a spline? Uh, or is it going to be none? You, you might have just an arrow on one head, on uh, one end, and the text, and no line in between. Uh, it's it's very, very modifiable, very customizable. So that's how leaders work, uh, how M leaders work. Um, again, you can pick and choose what you want to use. Uh, the majority of the time we see drawings come in from customers, most people at this point have, have switched over to M leaders. And, and as you see up here in the leaders palette, there really isn't a way. If you hover over this, it says M leader. Um, if you hover over this, it says M leader. There really isn't a way other than command line and maybe toolbars to make regular leaders and queue leaders. Uh, but it's good to know that they're there and uh, and they'll, they'll probably remain in the product indefinitely. I mentioned like uh, many other things that people got used to because uh, just when you think something's been obsoleted, you, you try to take it out of the program and people scream bloody murder that you've taken my favorite pro uh, command away from the program and I used it for 20 years. And uh, it happens a lot, so we try not to do that. Um, so lastly, and, and very quickly, I, I'm going to give short shrift to annotative scaling here, but we'll try to cover it here. So I'm going to show you two comparison drawings here, and for the most part, I'm, I, I did my best to make them look identical. So uh, a non-annotative drawing, here is an example. I've got a model. It's this same old house drawing, and, and on the model at various points I've drawn dimensions for various dimension uh, distances. Uh, and as you can see down in my layout tabs here, I've got one that's a paper size of 36 by 48, and another that's a paper size of 11 by 17. Now in both cases, I want my text to come out to be a half inch. When I lay ruler to paper, 
I want to measure this text height as a half inch. So I've done that here. And if you were to plot these out, that's what, what you would get. Now, in order to accomplish that, though, since I'm not using annotative scaling, I will show you uh, my dim styles here. And in order to accomplish what I've done here, I had to use four different dimension styles to get things the way that I want them because my viewports are scaled differently. And I'll show you what I mean here. We'll look at properties. We'll pick this first viewport here. It's scaled at a half inch equals a foot. This next one over here, because it's showing a different part of the detail, it's scaled at 330 seconds equals a foot. And this bottom one here, it's eighth inch equals a foot. And even still, I think on this one, I did quarter inch equals a foot. So for every different viewport scale you have, if you want to have your text come out the same height physically on the paper when you plot it out, or in PDF, if you're making PDFs, uh, you have to use different dimension styles, and that's why for each viewport, and I've got four viewports in this drawing, I end up having four different dimension styles. And the difference between them is their fit factors. So if we take a look at this, and this is a little bit of what Mike had showed earlier. If we look at the fit, we're using an overall scale factor to make the text come out to the height we want it to be. Uh, 96, for example, is the one for the eighth inch. Uh, and you get that by just multiplying uh, 8 by 12. Uh, if we look at the half inch, let's look at the fit for it. It's set for 24, and again, that's uh, 2 times 12. That's how we're coming up with these numbers here. So let's go over then to an annotative. Uh, and before I leave the non-annotative drawing, I want to point out that this 300 here is used in two different places. Um, I've got it here, and I've also got it here on my 36 by 48. Now, if I were to measure these, they're a little bit different uh, height uh, because they are the same dimension. So I can't show them exactly the same text height in two different viewports that have different scales if I'm using non-annotative dimensioning. So if I go over to my annotative drawing now, let's take a look. Looks the same. We look at this one. This one's the same. Now the reason this looks so small is because keep in mind this is a 36 by 48 inch piece of paper. If we zoom in here and if we were to print this out, it, this text would indeed come out to be 0.5 and I'll show you what my dim style looks like here. I'm only using one instead of four. and I'm set for a text height of 0.5. So that's why everything's coming out 0.5. So on this 36 by 48 inch piece of paper, this text height is half inch, and on my 11 by 17, they look bigger comparatively because it's a smaller piece of paper, but it's also half inch size text when you lay the ruler on the paper. Now to accomplish this, you've got to be wary of a couple of things. There are, uh, when you are on your model and you go to draw um, dimensions or text or any other annotative object for that matter, there is this scale adjustment down here that adjusts your annotation scale, and I'll show you what that does. If we change it to quarter inch equals, of, or eighth inch equals a foot, for example, you see the size of the text differently. Now, if we go back to a layout, though, it hasn't changed anything because I only changed the annotation scale on the model tab. And similarly, if I'm on a viewport and I change the viewport's annotation scale, let's say I change it to, well, let's just do eighth inch equals a foot here. Okay, everything else changes size because we've changed scale in the viewport, but if I print this out, again, my text is going to be maintained at a half inch real paper height. And that's the goal here, to add flexibility because maybe you don't always know what uh, scale you're going to need for your viewports, or maybe uh, your model is too big and maybe you do need to try out different scales uh, to fit on the piece of paper. 
and that's where annotation scaling comes in really, really nicely uh, because you can maintain it all with one annotation scale uh, or one dimension style rather that's annotative. And there are a couple of variables that control things. Um, this anno, this button down here you see on the right, it adds scales to your annotative objects whenever the annotation scale changes. So, and I'll show you what I mean by that. If I take a look at this, you can see all the different representations for all the different annotation scales that are maintained in this object. And if I look over here in my properties palette, these are all the different scales. And the way, reason they got added is because this blue icon down here was set up to do so. So if I change my viewport to an annotation scale that isn't in this list, what will happen, is, let's say 1 to 10, for example, isn't in this list. Okay. If I pick my viewport and I change my annotation scale to be 1 to 10, If I then pick my dimension object, which is hard to see at this point, <laughs> it now has been added, this 1 to 10 annotation scale to its list. And all other annotation objects are the same way. All other annotation objects will have picked up this new annotation scale just by the virtue of me changing to it in my viewport properties. Now, the show annotation objects always is the other key one down here. And uh, again, the, there will be more at the end of the uh, PowerPoint slide deck, so we're probably going to run out of time here. But if you don't have this one blue, then what that means is that any annotation object that doesn't contain this current scale, uh, annotation scale of your viewport, that annotation object won't be shown. So, for example, if I, I'll show you what that means here. If we uh, deselect the option to automatically add a new scale anytime we change, and we unclick this here, let's change to a, an annotation scale that isn't uh, present in my dimension. Uh, for example, let's do um, let's do one to sixteen. Okay, so there it is. Now you notice this is where the dimension was. It's missing now. It's not displayed because this only says show annotation objects at current scale, but it's not selected. Now, if we pick this, there it is. So sometimes you'll be working and you might think, hey, what happened to my dimensions? Take a look at this guy down here and make sure that it's not turned off because if it is, it may be hiding some of your dimensions and other annotative objects from you because they don't contain the current viewport's annotation scale. Uh, there's a lot to cover. Um, again, annotation scaling could probably take up its own full hour-long presentation, and I'm sure we will at some point, but I uh, wanted to give you just the glossy overview here. Again, if you look at the, the uh, video once we post it up and go through a little more slowly, uh, I'll sound a little like this probably when you play it at half speed. And of course, that'll even sound worse. It'll sound like quarter speed now. Um, but it may uh, make sense for you a little better to grasp as you go through it because uh, I have been just kind of blowing through this here. So. Annotation scaling, it's good. It takes a little bit more thinking ahead on the front end, but as we've seen in a comparison between these two drawings, you know, it can really save you from having to maintain several dimension styles. And that's not even to, to talk about text styles, uh, because dimensions aren't the only kind of annotation objects we have. Um, and you can see how it quickly could spiral out of control with uh, trying to maintain all of your styles. So annotative scaling really, uh, when it came along with the 2008 version of AutoCAD, really, really helped us out as far as uh, lightening the load and, and again, keeping track of all these different styles to make sense of your annotation objects. So hopefully that wasn't too fast. Again, the video is going to be up there. Have a look at it go through it. Uh, I'm sure we'll touch on these subjects again. Maybe we'll do a whole hour and some time on just annotation scaling uh, because it's certainly there's enough content in there that, that it would warrant a full hour. 
But uh, at this point, we're at the top of the hour. So before we go, I do want to run one more poll. Uh, and we'll pop this out here real quick. And if you could give us some feedback, that'd be fantastic. As always, at the end, we ask if you've learned anything at all. And we hope that you do. Um, it looks like we got mostly S's here. Uh, a few jaded professionals out there never have learned anything from us, and they never will. But we thank you for attending anyway. Um, so uh, I'll close this out I'll give you the quick results there of the poll. All righty. As always, we thank you for attending these. Uh, you're the reason we do them. We hope we can help you out. We hope we expose you to some new features in the program to help you do your work a little more efficiently. Uh, if you need training, get training. There's all kinds of good stuff out there from our reseller partners that double as training centers. Uh, Autodesk.com slash training will get you in touch with all that. Uh, until next time, till the end of, uh, end of the month, we will see you and uh, enjoy. <laughs>